my wife and I have decided to attempt to live on World War II style rations for a month. That's a bit of a sort of social experiment. Why on earth would you want to do that, I hear you ask? Well. In the early days of the recent pandemic, there were rumours of rationing being brought in as food shortages and empty shelves became the norm. Remember everyone hoarding toilet roll? I know it feels like ages ago now. Anyway, before and during the pandemic, we had our own allotment and have grown many of our own vegetables for years. Many of our neighbours have chickens and we began swapping fruit and veg for eggs. This led us to look further into rationing and we found an episode of a TV series where two people lived off rationing for a week and at the end they checked how the diet made them feel and how it affected their bodies. I didn't think a week was long enough to notice any difference, so we decided to try it ourselves for a whole month. We'll weigh ourselves at the start of the month and then at regular intervals throughout the project. We'll share with you the quantities allowed in rationing and some of the recipes that the government came up with in order to keep the population fed and healthy. To keep a feel of authenticity we won't be storing anything in our freezer as they weren't widely available at the time and we'll also be giving up the TV. We will keep the fridge as many houses would have had some sort of cold cupboard or larder. The month we've chosen for this is the last month of the war in Europe, 8th of April to the 8th of May. Rationing quantities did change throughout the war due to gluts and shortages, so we're taking an average across the war rather than specifically 1945. What I will be doing however is a daily diary of sorts, tracking many of the events as the last month of the war in Europe unfolded how the Third Reich fell apart, how the post-war borders began to be drawn, and how the attention slowly began to shift to the Japanese. I will be using an array of first-hand accounts of people who served on both sides, as well as historians who have studied that period. My first-hand sources include people at the top, such as Churchill, Monty, Patton, Guderian, Keitel, Dönitz, Cunningham, and Allenbrook, all the way down to frontline troops such as a U-boat commander, a tank commander, and an artillery officer. It will not be an exhaustive diary, but I hope to pick out various salient points. The situation as it stood up to the 8th of April 1945 was roughly as follows. The Allies had driven the Germans out of Africa, and in September 43, the Allies had landed on mainland Italy, and Italy switched sides the following month. German troops now occupied Italy as invaders rather than allies. In June 1944, the Western Allies successfully landed on the beaches of Normandy, in September that year, they attempted to take various bridges in the Netherlands, paving a way to Germany, but Operation Market Garden was only partially successful. Finland changed sides that month. On the 16th of January 1945, Hitler moved his headquarters to a bunker near the Reich Chancellery in Berlin. The Russian army liberated Auschwitz on the 27th of January, and the Allied government heads met at the Yalta Conference on the 4th of February. Hitler knew the war was lost, but did his best to hide it. The constant stress and injuries from the bomb plot the year before had taken its toll on his health. Historian Robin Cross writes, Hitler presented a dreadful physical spectacle, like a man risen from the grave. Awash with drugs, hunched and shaking, with faltering voice, foul breath and glaucous eyes. Spittle and cake crumbs flecking his lips, his jacket blotched with food stains. Major Gerhard Bott, Krebs ADC, met Hitler in early February 1945 and described him thus. His head was slightly wobbling, his left arm hung slackly and his hand trembled. An indescribable flickering light in his eye creating a fearsome and wholly unnatural effect. His face gave the impression of total exhaustion. All his movements were those of a senile man. During Operation Plunder, launched on the 23rd of March, the Western Allies finally crossed the Rhine, succeeding here where they'd failed in Market Garden. On the 27th of March, Guderian was dismissed and replaced by Krebs, a final action that may have saved Guderian's life later in the war. Germany was getting really desperate. Luftwaffe personnel were transferred to parachute divisions with no training. Goering and Dönitz were looking to transfer 30,000 men from the Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine to the army to fight the Russians. Anything to slow down the Russian army and allow civilians to head west and surrender to the Americans, British and Canadians. Marshals Zhukov and Konev had been tasked by Stalin to see which of them could get to Berlin first. Hitler wasn't the only leader in bad health. American President Franklin D. Roosevelt 
had been very ill for a long time and he was only getting worse. According to Anthony Beaver, on the 30th of March Roosevelt was taken to Warm Springs in Georgia and was barely conscious. Allied leaders had met several times throughout the war in Cairo and Tehran in 1943 and Yalta in 1945. At the 1943 meetings, they discussed strategies to be used against the Germans and Japanese, and the 1945 meetings were used to discuss how borders in Europe and Asia should look after the Axis' eventual surrender. Churchill said, The whole shape and structure of post-war Europe clamoured for review. When the Nazis were beaten, how was Germany to be treated? And once military aims were achieved, what measures and what organisation could the three great allies provide for the future peace and good governance of the world? On the 26th of March, Churchill was with Monty and Allenbrook in Europe. Monty was collecting signatures of all the top leaders, and when Churchill signed the book, he wrote, Forward on wings of flame to final victory. By the 31st of March, Monty says he wants to take Berlin and notes that Eisenhower agreed back in September 1944, but disagrees now. Ike felt that Berlin was just a geographical location and of no importance to the Allies. It's worth noting here that Monty is coloured by the fact he fought in the First World War, and is acutely aware that the British didn't actually conquer Germany in that war by taking their capital. Monty wants to make sure this time round. Ike didn't fight in World War I, and therefore doesn't see it as that important, particularly as he's agreed with Stalin that Russia can have Berlin. On the 1st of April, the motto broadcast on German radio was Conquer or Die, and any house seen with a white flag would lead to the occupants being shot. With the collapse of Germany apparently imminent, America, Britain and Australia were beginning to shift their attention to Japan and the war in the east. On the 7th of April, the 72,000 ton Yamato, one of the largest battleships ever constructed, was sunk by American naval forces taking around 3,000 crewmen with her. I thought I'd kick off my What Happened on This Day in 1945 with a Victoria Cross action in Italy. Anders Larsen was a highly decorated Special Forces officer who'd fought in Northwest Europe, North Africa, Crete, the Aegean Islands, Greece, and Yugoslavia. As a commando, he specialised in butcher and bolt raids and had already been awarded the Military Cross three times by the beginning of 1945. By April 1945, the Germans had been driven back north and all the fighting was now around the top of Italy, around the Po and Senio rivers. On the night of the 8th of April, Larsen was leading a troop of 17 men on a raid on the north shore of Lake Camaccio in northern Italy. With no previous reconnaissance possible, he was tasked with causing as much damage and noise as possible to make the Germans think there was a major landing taking place and distract from the main breakthrough effort going on 20 miles away in the Argenta Gap. The area chosen for the distraction raid turned out to be a thin strip of completely flat land with no cover bordered by Lake Camaccio on one side and the Adriatic Sea on the other. Larsen was advancing on the town of Camaccio when his group was accosted by a sentry. The Germans didn't believe their story of being fishermen and a firefight broke out. The narrow strip of land was covered by multiple machine gun nests and blockhouses. Larsen took out one position with grenades, which knocked out two machine guns and four Germans. Ignoring the hail of bullets, he took on a second position with grenades, knocking out two machine guns, killing two Germans and taking two prisoners. Still under heavy fire, Larsen advanced on a third bunker, again throwing grenades as he ran. A voice inside the bunker called out, Camarade, as if to surrender. Larsen advanced to within only a few yards of the bunker, shouting for the occupants to come out. At that moment, he was hit by machine gun fire, but managed to throw a grenade as he fell. The explosion incapacitated the occupants enough that his men were able to clear the enemy out. Mortally wounded, Larsen refused to be evacuated because he felt he would slow his men down. He died of his wounds and was awarded the Victoria Cross. His citation reads, By his magnificent leadership and complete disregard for his personal safety, Major Larsen had, in the face of overwhelming superiority, achieved his objectives. Three positions were wiped out, accounting for six machine guns, killing eight and wounding others of the enemy, and two prisoners were taken. The high sense of devotion to duty, and the esteem in which he was held by his men, added to his own magnificent courage, enabled Major Larson to carry out all the tasks he had been given with complete success. He's buried at the Argenta Gap War Cemetery.